turn in your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 3. You have a responsibility. If you're a Christian, how many of you are born again? You love God with all of your heart? You want to do things for God? Excellent. I believe that within, oh, the next short period of time that we have, that we're going to see lots and lots of people saved. You know, I really believe it. There's uh, lots of things happening. There's, you know, the, the hurricane that just went through Florida and is heading up to uh, North and South Carolina. In fact, you know what? Let's pray for them right now. They've had a lot of flooding, a lot of hurricane activity already. Let's just pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our East Coast. I pray, Father, that you would protect those people, that you would help them, that you would provide refuge for them in the name of Jesus, that salvation would ring out in that area, that, Father, people who have never prayed before would begin to pray. And, Lord, you said that if the people would pray, that you would, you would hear their prayers, you would uh, heal the land, and, Father, that land needs healing because it's been ravaged by storms and floods. So, Father, I, I just pray for your people that they would humble themselves, that they would hit their knees and begin to pray. And I pray that, that other people that don't even know you would begin to pray and they would call on you and they would be saved in Jesus' name. Saved in their souls and saved from calamity. Father, I thank you for protecting those people and bringing them close to you. Not, uh, Father, we know you're not the author of destruction. We know that you're not. So, Father, you are the author, author of healing and help and deliverance. So we ask you to bring that to those people on the East Coast. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. You know, God will take bad things and turn them into good. That's what I like about him. He's a good God. Ezekiel chapter 3 and starting in verse 17. Let's read this and see what it says. This is the word of the Lord coming to, to Ezekiel. And he says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because you did not give him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. And this is an amazing passage of Scripture, and he's talking to Ezekiel about being a watchman. You know, If you're standing out here, Pipeline Road, especially right here at the top of the hill, is particularly tricky because people come up from that direction over this hill and, I, I mean, you can't see. I, I've, I've seen accidents out here, more than one, where somebody comes flying over this hill and someone has stopped to make a turn one way or the other and uh, wasn't going slow enough to be able to stop in time. And they, you know, slam on their brakes, screech all over the place, and hit. You know, I don't know why they haven't put more warning signs on this road, you know, warning hill, people crossing, whatever. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just kind of interesting. But if you knew your friend was out there and that danger was coming, what would you do? What would you do? You'd warn them, okay? Why? Because you love your friend. You see, you see a little kid uh, walking towards you know, a ledge, and there's water down there, and you know he's not old enough to swim. What are you going to do? You're going to warn them. You're going to stop them. You're going to alter their course so that they don't get hurt. See? That's taking the responsibility on yourself to help people. Well, you know, we've got a spiritual responsibility to the people around us. How many of you go to public school? Okay. Do you know some people that are uh, on their way to hell and they're going as fast as they can? You know some people like that? Well, you know what? Someone needs to warn them. Someone needs to stop them. Someone needs to say something to them. Now, uh, turn over to Ezekiel chapter 33. Let's look at another passage of Scripture here. We're going to jump around Ezekiel a little bit. Starting in verse 7. He says, so you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and shall warn them for me. 
When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn away, uh, turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Now, it's interesting to me that on, on the first side of this, you know, God says, if I say to the wicked, you shall die because of your wickedness. But the wicked aren't listening. See? I mean, God's speaking. God's reaching. God's done some things in order to reach out to the wicked, but they don't get it. See? He has said, hey, I am talking to the wicked, and I'm saying, turn from your way, but I need some help here. I need some of you to help me out here because I'm speaking. The Holy Spirit's moving. The Holy Spirit's touching people's lives. But see, you know, uh, sometimes when you dream a dream, you go, oh, you know, that's just some weird dream. You know, I had pizza before I went to sleep last night or, you know, something like that. And, and you just discount it, you know. You just go, oh, well. But you know what? If somebody came up to you during the day and, and said something to you that was exactly the same thing as your dream, you'd think twice about it, wouldn't you? Well, that's what it's like for the wicked. They think, you know, they're going along. There's indications that, hey, this is the wrong direction. Turn around, go the other way. There's indications of that, but they discount it left and right. They go, ah, well, that's no big, you know, that's just, oh, well, it's, you know, that's just my mom saying stuff to me when I was little. Oh, that's just, you know, uh, guilty conscience stuff. That doesn't mean anything. But when somebody comes up to them and confirms it by saying something to them, it begins to really click and come together in their heart and in their mind. And he says, that this is real serious stuff. He says, if you don't warn them, their blood I will require at your hand. But if you do warn them and they go on their way anyway and die in their sin or, or reap the results of their sin, he says, if you've warned them, if you've done your part, then you have delivered your soul. Well, I think that's kind of interesting because you know, the, the, the way that the Bible states this, the way that this thing looks is that because of the responsibility God gives us as believers, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, this is serious stuff. This isn't just go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or maybe just some of them. Preach the gospel to every creature, you know, if, if they don't look like an axe murderer, you know. There's no ifs on it. It's just like go and preach to every creature. Now, you, you read the book of Acts. From Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 10 is a period of about 10 years. And during that period of time, the apostles went into all the world and preached the gospel to every creature who was Jewish. And that's all. They didn't preach to any Gentiles. They didn't preach to any Italians. They didn't preach to any Greeks. They only... Well, I, if they went to Greece and there were Jews there, they'd preach to those Jews. If they went to Italy and there were Jews there, they'd preach to those Jews. But they didn't preach to any Gentiles, any, uh, uh, anybody outside of the uh, Israelite family. And in their minds, they were doing what Jesus said to do. But in Acts chapter 10, something interesting happens. Peter's praying one day and he has this vision of a sheet coming out of the sky and it's got all these unclean animals and he hears a voice and it says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, No. Now, when the Lord's speaking to you, a good thing to say is, Yes, not no. He says, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. Well, this vision happened three different times in a row to get Peter's attention. And then the, the sheet went off and then there was somebody at the door and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, get up and go with these men. Don't, don't worry about it. Just go. And so he knew the voice of the Lord. This was Peter. This was the pastor at Jerusalem. This was the guy, see, that had gotten the instructions from Jesus go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every creature. And who had he preached to? Jews only. Okay? Well, he shows up, he follows these men, he goes with them, he shows up at a guy's house that is a Roman, the Jews were in bondage to the Romans at the time. Not only was he a Roman, but he was a centurion, he was a Roman soldier. He was a Gentile, he wasn't Jewish, 
he was Roman. The Jews hated the Romans. And he was a centurion. Not only was he a Roman, but he was part of the army. He was part of the group that was keeping the Jews in bondage. But this one guy, this Roman centurion, prayed all the time and gave like crazy. And as a result of that, God picked him to open the door of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, to those people who weren't born Jewish, which was a huge breakthrough. Okay? Uh, now, how the apostles could have spent three and a half years with Jesus listening to him preach, following him, and he says something so specific, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and then get stuck in this rut of just preaching to Jews only. It's just amazing to me. But, you know, a lot of times we do the same thing. Because, you know, right around us, I mean, there's whole worlds of people right under our nose that haven't even been touched by the good news that Jesus Christ came to give them peace in their hearts. They don't know. See? So what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to share that with other people. Now, the way that God puts this to Ezekiel is real serious. It's like, look, if somebody uh, is sinning and I tell you to go and warn them and you don't do it, then their blood, I will, I will hold you responsible. Not for their sin. Look over at Ezekiel chapter 18. Hold your place in Ezekiel 33, though, because we're going to come back there. But look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18. I, I, I want to point this out because you're not responsible for somebody else's sins, okay? If somebody else is sinning, you're not responsible for their sins. Look at this in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. He says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Okay? People are responsible for their own sin. You are not responsible for their sin. So, what is your responsibility? Go back to Ezekiel 33. Let's start in verse 1 this time. He says, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Okay? So the picture here is the fact that you are taking your responsibility to say something, to stop someone, to warn someone, to set a standard, to raise a standard, okay? To show uh, the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. That's your responsibility, is to warn. God set us as, as watchmen, okay? Now, you go to school or you're at a job and you're a watchman. You're supposed to be spiritually aware of what's going on around you to the point to where if somebody is messing up and they're doing something that's going to be harmful to them, that you can do something or say something to them. That's your responsibility. You're not responsible for their sin. You are responsible to reach out to them, to help them. All right? God's wanting to bring salvation to your generation. I think it's so awesome. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That's you guys. Young men will see visions. That's you guys. Old men will dream dreams. <laughs> That's me. And uh, on my servants and my handmaidens, I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I'll show signs and wonders and, and miracles and different things. And it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are on the verge of 
a huge harvest of souls and a huge influx of people coming into the kingdom of heaven. See? But part of this is going to be us taking our position as believers to be able to steer these masses in the right direction. Now, I got saved in 1974, right in the middle of the Jesus People movement, which was kind of a branch off of the hippie movement. And all of us were really groovy, and we were cool, and, you know, wild man, and all of that stuff, you know, it's, that was us. And, uh, but there were lots of cults. I mean, it was a, definitely a spiritual awakening, but it was a spiritual awakening of a very broad magnitude, okay? I mean, there were cults everywhere. Uh, they had cults like uh, Hare Krishnas. I, I mean, you've seen stuff maybe about them in the airports with their bald heads and their ponytails, you know, playing tambourines and collecting money. Uh, any of you ever seen someone from that? Yeah, usually in airports. Uh, Sun Myung Moon and uh, uh, his thing. There, there was a cult called the Children of God and the guy who was in charge of it was named David Moses. And the whole thing was was very lustful and sexual. and it was, I mean, it was just bizarre. And you know what? Young people were jumping into these cults left and right. I mean, and tons of young people were getting saved and receiving Jesus as the Lord and Savior. It was a very broad spiritual awakening that was going on. Okay? Because there was such a great spiritual hunger in our country at that time. But there was also a very strong need for watchmen. Okay? I mean, a whole society became hungry for God and was just energized to seek after spiritual things. Well, how about our society right now? I mean, you can't hardly even turn on the TV without seeing the 1-800 psychic hotline tell your future, read your palm over the phone kind of thing. See? There is a huge spiritual awakening right now and there is a need for watchmen. I, was, I got so excited. I was talking to some young people one time. They said, they said we took advantage of the opportunity of our generation being spiritually hungry. They took a card table, a couple of pieces of poster board, went to the mall, set up the card table in a, in a corner, and made a sign that said, free advice. Well, in the midst of our generation, it's all kinds of, you know, come find out your future and stuff like that. People would come over and, the, you know, they'd sit down and have a couple of chairs next to the card table. Said, okay, uh, what do you need to know? And it's just, that's all it said, free advice. They sit down, the person there says, what do you need to know? Well, I'm going through this problem with my boyfriend, and I really don't know what to do. And, okay, well, here, give me your hand. Well, okay, here's my advice to you. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You know, just witness to him, share Jesus with him, pray for him, and stuff like that. Just, you know, I just thought, how cool to take advantage of an opportunity like that. We met another young man who was with, I think, Youth with a Mission in Australia this last trip. And uh, they were ministering in an area where there were a lot of, you know, people who were into crystals and uh, just all kinds of spiritual things, you know, like that. And they would set up a little booth that said free prayer. He said, you wouldn't believe how many people come over for free prayer. It's just amazing. But what are they doing? Taking advantage of the opportunity in a spiritually hungry generation. See? What is that? Watchmen. Watchmen. People taking their post and doing something. Now, I'm not saying bring a card table to school tomorrow, set it up, you know, free outside of biology class, free, free advice. But, you know, God will show you what to do. God will lead you. God will direct you. He'll show you. But you've got to take your position and take your place as a believer and as a Christian. See, you're not responsible for their sins, but you are responsible to be a watchman. To watch out for them. Why? Because they don't know how to do it themselves. I want to show you a couple other verses that go along with this. Look at Matthew chapter 27 in the New Testament. Matthew 27. In looking at these scripture verses in Ezekiel, it just kind of got me going. Uh, Jesse preached a message just last Thursday, and, and he went over a verse, and it got me going in this direction. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 27, in verse, starting in verse 25, this is Jesus before Pilate at his trial. The governor asked and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. 
Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And look at verse 25. This just amazes me. And all the people answered and said about Jesus, His blood be on us and on our children. Whew. In other words, Pilate's saying, look, I'm not going to be responsible for this man's death. Pilate, I mean, Pilate, when talking to Jesus, he said, well, are you a king? Jesus said, you know, you've said I'm a king, but my kingdom's not of this world. It's of a different world. Pilate's like, uh-oh. Pilate, Pilate's wife sends a message to him. She says, I've had just an amazing dream about this man. Don't have anything to do with him. I mean, all of this stuff's coming up in front of Pilate, and it's just hitting him in the face, see? I mean, he's being warned. And he's taking the warning. This is so amazing to me. This is like a Roman leader uh, having to do with uh, the Jews, oversight over the Jews as his position and responsibility. And he took this stuff seriously. So he got a, a basin out there with water in it, and he scoops up the water in his hands, and he says, look, I am free and innocent of the blood of this man. And all the people, this says all the people that were there, the Jewish leaders and, and the people that they had stirred up against Jesus, they all said together, His blood be upon us and upon our children. You know what? If they had had any kind of clue what they were saying, do you think they would have said that? Good Lord. All right, now go over to Acts chapter 5 real quick. This is what Jesse was talking about the other night. And this just hit me. Acts chapter 5, the disciples were preaching and the Pharisees and Jewish leaders were bringing them in uh, and warning them and threatening them. Acts chapter 5 and verse 28. The priests were talking to him saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now, remember uh, when Peter was in there preaching, he said, you know, you have delivered Jesus up to be crucified, who has been risen from the dead and is exalted now and is the Son of God, and through him you can find salvation. And they got upset. And that's when they replied and said this, we've commanded you not to speak in this name. And then they said, this is just amazing to me. They said, you intend to bring this man's blood on us. That's not what Peter was doing. They had already claimed responsibility for this that we just saw in Matthew chapter 27. They had claimed responsibility for this. Jesus talks over in, in, in Luke chapter 11, he, he talks about to his generation, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day. He says, look, you know what? The blood of all of the prophets. He says, you testify of the works of your fathers who killed the prophets and the blood of all of the prophets is going to be required of this generation. I thought, that's a heavy saying. You know, that's amazing. Well, what's the deal with that? Well, they hadn't taken their responsibility. What was their responsibility? Jesus said, you get up in the morning and you look at the sky and you say, well, it's going to be a good day because the sky looks this way. Or you say, it's going to be a bad day because the sky looks that way. He says, look, you can discern the sky, but you're not discerning the signs of the times. If they had discerned the signs of the times, they would have realized that the Son of God was standing right in front of them. Okay. Now, if, if there was a whole group of religious leaders that missed it the first time Jesus came, you know what I think is going to happen? There's also going to be a whole group of religious leaders that miss it the second time Jesus comes. Why? Because they're not discerning the signs of the times. How does that happen? You don't take your place. You get calloused in your Christianity. Christianity just becomes a form of godliness without any power. You're just playing Christian, and you don't have a heart of compassion to help people. What does that mean? God has a heart of compassion for people. If you as a believer don't care 
about what happens to anybody else, then you have lost the heart of the Father. Because the heart of the Father, you see it in Jesus, He was moved with compassion. I mean, it's just so amazing reading these stories. John the Baptist was beheaded in prison. Jesus went off to be alone. They followed Him to where He was. And instead of Jesus blowing it off and saying, get these people out of here. Can't you see that I'm hurting? Instead of doing that, Jesus was moved with compassion and healed their sick. He put his own feelings aside and he said, okay, I'm going to help these people. I mean, what a black eye for the devil, you know? Instead of, you know, just being filled with remorse over what had happened, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. These guys were close. See? I mean, they, they were not only connected, you know, by their families, but they were connected by the anointing and ministry, see? So this was a major deal. But instead of just, you know, in, instead of having to go away and kind of recoup and regroup and, and figure it out, he saw these multitudes and he was moved with compassion. When you look at a group of people, what do you see? What do you see? Guys, when you look at a group of people, do you see all the cute chicks? Or do you see people with needs? <laughs> Girls, when you look at a group of, of people, what do you see? You see... Guys with tight jeans? Or do you see people with needs? What does God see? God sees people. See? We need to become people-minded like God is people-minded. If we have God in us, we're going to feel the same way God does about people. See, just, just feeling guilty because somebody might uh, sin and, and pay the price for it isn't going to get this job done. See, Being a watchman means taking your position, not just the responsibility of reaching out to other people, but it means taking on yourself the heart and the compassion of a God who sent His Son to die for people. How many of you have ever had a hard time witnessing to somebody else? Okay. But Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, He says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses. He didn't say you'll go out and witness. He said you'll become something. And that's different. See, just, just taking the post of a watchman, you know, that's one thing. But having a heart for the people behind the wall, that's another thing. If you're just a, Jesus talked about shepherds and hirelings, if you're just there because, hey, you feel like you're supposed to or someone told you you ought to, I mean, don't do this because I'm just saying, hey, you should be doing this. But you know what we ought to do? We ought to cry out to God and say, God, fill us with a heart of compassion for people. See? What will that do? That will create a sensitivity in your heart that will lead you and direct you to hurting people that need what you have. This part is so important. I mean, in... I think it's Acts chapter 3. Peter and John were coming into the temple and there was a guy sitting there that had been there for years and years. He was crippled. He couldn't walk. It's the same gate Jesus came in and out of a whole bunch of times. And the guy was there. But Jesus didn't heal him. Okay? So, what's the message? There were a whole bunch of people in the book of Acts that got healed that probably Jesus walked right by. Well, what's, what's the deal with that? Jesus always did the will of the Father. The key isn't running outside the door, running down to you know, the little store on the corner and, and yelling Jesus into the face of everybody you meet. That's not the key. The key is having that Father's heart of compassion for people to the point that you are led by the Spirit and you hone in on the direction of God so that, so that there's fruit. It's ripe every time. If you just... You know, go out throwing Jesus at everybody. You know, you get a handful of tracks, you run up to someone and you throw them in their face and scream, get saved! Is that going to be fruitful? Effective? Is that going to help them? <laughs> no, they might have to go to the doctor and get it surgically removed from their eyeball. You know? What is God wanting? God's wanting us to be like Him. That's what He's wanting. God's a watchman. God is saying to the wicked, stop it. And they can't hear it. So he's saying, would you guys please come help me? Here's a person who's hurting. They're dying. Would you help me? 
They're not listening. I mean, they can hear it, but they're not listening. Would you help me talk to them? Say, why? Because God wants to set them free. God wants to deliver them. Look at Acts chapter 20. Starting in verse, uh, let's see, verse 22. Acts 20, 22. He says, and see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. This is just, this is twofold, all right? Not only is it uh, an outstanding picture of somebody who has stepped into this position that we're talking about tonight to preach the gospel to everybody that the Lord leads him to, every place that he goes to. He's, he's not ashamed. He's not afraid. He's, he's not intimidated by the things that they do. He's going to do what God's shown him to do regardless of the circumstances. Not only is that just an outstanding example of what that means, but also it's a, 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 an amazing picture of the forgiveness of God, because he says, I am innocent of the blood of all men. You know what Paul was before he became a Christian? He was a Christian killer. For him to make this statement means that he had truly been crucified with Christ. He had truly put his past behind him. It was buried, that his sins were gone, because he says, I am innocent of the blood of all men. But this ought to spur us on to fulfill the position that God is calling us to do. One more verse, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Everyone say, oh boy. <laughs> Here's what he says. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse uh, 25. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look at verse 28. Him, Jesus Christ, we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Here's what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to do a work in you that will produce this kind of energy that he expresses in verse 28. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. He said, I do this by the working of God that works in me mightily. Now, this isn't just magic. This isn't just Paul walking around one day and the magic Jesus fairy shows up with his magic wand and pops uh, Paul on the head, ding! And Paul suddenly becomes super Christian guy. Here's what I think happened. Jesus did show up. Jesus did reveal himself to Paul. Okay? But Paul had a decision to make. Every single one of us have a decision to make. We can choose reality or we can choose religion. I grew up with religion, guys. I, I grew up going to church and I never knew Jesus. I grew up uh, attending Sunday school. I, I was in charge of our youth group when I was 16. And I wasn't born again. We played charades in the basement. We had rock concerts in the church. Yeah, in Agata de Vida. Honey, don't you know that I love you? You know, I, I'm serious. We did that. That was one of our songs. Praise God. We didn't have Jesus. We had religion. It was dead. I was an acolyte. Anyone know what an acolyte is? I wore a robe and carried the little candlestick, came down the middle aisle and lit the candles before the service. I grew up in church and I didn't have Jesus. And I was lonely, and I was afraid, and I was insecure, and I was introverted. 
And I didn't have the life of God working on the inside of me. But guys, when I found the reality that is Jesus, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I mean, when, this, when, when God touched my life, when God called me into youth ministry to minister to teenagers, you know, I mean, this was back in 1976 and 77 when youth ministry wasn't very well defined. It was very kumbaya. Okay? I'm serious. I mean, very hippie, sit in a circle. You know, it only takes a spark. And we were just very, very kumbaya. Okay? We were ha- I mean, we had the life of God, though. I mean, and it was growing in us. It was happening in us. But when God called me to reach out to young people and minister to teenagers, wow. You know what? I think about teenagers all the time. I, I scare teenagers. I walk up to them in the mall and go, hey, how you doing? They're like, adult, stranger, stranger, stranger. Maybe I am stranger than most, but you know what, though? I can't help it. I can't help it. Why? I love people because I love God. When you love God, you have to love people. When you really have this intense relationship with him, you can't help it. Because when you look at people, you begin to see them like God sees them. You know what? If you're intimidated by me, I apologize. You know? I mean, I humble myself, okay? If, if you're afraid to come and talk to me, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm really intense sometimes. You know? I mean, sometimes I get in teenagers' face, and I, I'm just scary. <laughs> I'm sorry if I come across that way. But you know what? It's because I care about you and I care about your future. I care about what goes on in your life. And if when you're around me, you feel bad because of things that have happened in your life, you know what? That's just the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's on your life. But you know what? I love you and God loves you. See? God wants to change things in your life so that you don't feel bad. So that you can feel good about yourself. And feel good about your relationship with Him. That's what God's doing what God wants to do with you. You've you've gone through too much of your life feeling bad about stuff already. Okay? Feeling guilty. uh, Looking backwards. Jesus said, uh, said, if you come to me, I will not turn you away. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I'll remove your sin from you. 1 John 1, 9, it says, if you confess your sins, I... I'm faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, you don't have to feel bad about your sin. Jesus took care of your sin. And this is good news. And what God's doing in you, He wants to do through you. What God's doing for you and releasing you from guilt and sin consciousness and, and fear and, and intimidation and loneliness. <laughs> I mean, when Jesus came into my life, man, He changed me. I was so shy. I was a mess. There's no way I could get up in front of people like this and talk to them. But he did something in my life. And he's doing something in you too. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. But I believe what God wants to do tonight is set you free from intimidation and inferiority. Set you free from religious ideas. I mean, some of you have grown up in church And some of you have gone to great churches. But to you, it's just been something to do. God wants to become real in your life. He is real. He's so awesome. He'll be your best friend. I want everyone to stand up right now. Come on, stand up with me. We have a responsibility to take a position. And this is a serious thing, okay? But God has not left us to do this on our own. God wants to do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. See? We have a responsibility to help other people. We need his help first so that we can help others. Okay? Just join hands with everybody. Just reach out and grab the hands of the person next to you. You know, there, there's, some, there's some young ladies in here that are going to be healed from some real serious hurts and wounds in their heart tonight, right now, as we pray. 
you know what? There's some young men in here, too, that you've been real shy. You, you've been almost just totally repressed in your personality because of situations that have happened. But God's going to turn that thing around. If you're that person who's been just oppressed by the enemy, you've just been carrying around guilt and all kinds of stuff, you know what? God's going to set you free right now. I want everyone to pray this prayer with me. Say, God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, I take my place. I take my responsibility. I step into my position to be a watchman, to have compassion. God, I ask you to fill me with the compassion you have for other people. Do a work in me so I can help somebody. I want to be sensitive to the needs of people around me. What you are doing in me, I want you to do through me. I trust you right now to fix my heart, to deliver me from inferiority, from oppression, from extreme shyness. Get that out of me. I want to take my position and be a blessing to my generation. God, I thank you that you're doing that in me now. In Jesus' name. Now just begin to pray for each other. Father, right now, we just minister to each other. We just release the strength of God and the stability of the Holy Spirit to establish these young people in reality. Not in religion, but in the reality of a relationship with you. You know what? Maybe there's some here tonight you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask everyone to say this prayer with me right now so that you can get this thing started. Some of you, I, I just believe there's a young man in here that you've had religion, but you haven't had this reality of a relationship with God. So I want everyone in this room to pray with me. Say, God, I ask Jesus to come into my heart to forgive me of every sin. I believe that Jesus came to the earth. He gave His life for me. He died on a cross. He shed His blood. He was buried in a tomb. And three days later, He rose from the dead. And He's alive right now. I receive that eternal life. And God, I want to walk with You. I want the reality of You in my life. I receive it now. And I'm going to serve You every day of my life. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your spirit so that I can walk with you and be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a big shout of praise. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what? If you prayed that prayer and something happened on the inside of you, I want to meet you tonight. I want to, I want to shake your hand. I want to, it, it'll bless me to look into your eyes and to know that God did that in your heart. You know, some of you have been walking along and I know what it's like to have religion and not have the reality of a relationship with God. Maybe you're in that same position. I'd like to meet you tonight if that's you. OK, I want our campus pastors to come up to the front uh, and, and just stand along here. And you know what? If, if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer of agreement uh, for anything, they would be glad to pray with you and agree with you uh, for that to happen. Some of you, you know what? Some of you need uh, some prayer for situations that are going on at home, uh, situations that you're dealing with. You just need that extra boost in prayer. These are our campus pastors. They are on our high school campuses, reaching out to young people, being a blessing and praying for people every week. And so I just want you, if you need prayer, to come up and see one of these. Let's, we're going to close in prayer right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that not one person will leave here without their needs being met, without knowing in their heart that God's working and doing something in their life. Lord, anyone in here who needs that extra prayer of agreement, I thank you that they're going to come to the front and they're going to receive a blessing from God. We thank you, God, for tonight. Thank you, Father, for, for increasing, Lord, our effectiveness in reaching out to other people. Make us that witness that you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Spencer and Cindy Nordyke, Reaching Nations and Generations. 
For more information, visit nordicministries.com.